I got my lesson done. I was so happy I got my lesson done and I could go finish something else. And then I walked in tonight and I said, I never did the PowerPoint. Oh, well. <laughs> so let's open with a word of prayer and uh, we'll get, get going here tonight. Father, we thank you for the day and ask your blessing on our study of your word tonight. We ask you to give us uh, wisdom and understanding of the things that we cover. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I'm glad you're here. I was just double checking. I might have to have somebody go grab me another prayer list here. Nope, right, there it is. I was going to say. My mind today is not good. Can't remember anything. What'd you say? <laughs> yeah. Coming quicker than I want to admit. All right. We are going to do um, one more word. Um, uh, I did have somebody ask about, um, and I'll, I'll just throw this in at the beginning, and somebody did ask about um, Abraham's bosom, that term. It's only used a couple times. Uh, it's just a means, of, it's just a way of describing paradise, as Jesus referred to it, uh, before um, before Christ died and final atonement was made for sin, people, when they died, did not go to heaven. They went to Abraham's bosom. Jesus kind of described this in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And, um, and so that's, that's what it means and it's what it's talking about. So it's only mentioned, I think, twice that way in the Bible. There's no special significance to the words, just... Abraham's bosom, and the word just means chest, so um, this refers to that, that particular place. So, but that's a whole other study as to the, the doctrines surrounding that, and that's uh, not uh, what we're going to do tonight. So um, I preached um, three weeks ago on the word, word worship and repentance and, and tied the two together, uh, but I realized I had not actually done a, a word study on repentance, and this is a word that, again, is often, um, it's often misdefined, and thus it, um, it can create some questions as, as to what the Bible means, because it's the wrong, it's the wrong definition. Uh, and so we're going to look at the word repent tonight. Uh, next week will be the tail end of our revival, be the last, uh, last evening with Brother Willette, uh, so uh, we will not be doing our study uh, next week, uh, but the following week, as of right now, I am either going to scour up another word or two to fill up the 13th week uh, for this, or if you have one, I still have, uh, I still have a week in which I can do any words uh, that I want, so uh, let me know on that. And then uh, after that, uh, we'll take a Wednesday night of just question, general Bible questions and answers. And uh, we can, we, again, you can submit those in writing to me ahead of time, and I will answer them. Uh, or you can just ask them in person here, and we'll, we'll do that. So that's what's coming up next few weeks. And uh, so tonight, looking at repentance, and again, uh, no PowerPoint. So um, you're making notes, you'll have to work a little harder than you used to, and uh, if I need to go back and repeat something, I will definitely do that for you, and uh, uh, if all else fails, I can just email you my notes, and uh, you, can, you can have everything that I have. So, um, so looking at the word repent or repentance, the different forms of the word repent, in the Old Testament, there's only really one word. There's a second word that's also translated repent, but... Um, it's, uh, it's used in a different context. It only appears twice, and it's, it's a different thought uh, in the way that it's used. And it's clear in the context uh, that the word is being used in a, in a completely different context than what it generally is. So um, in the Strong's number for it is 05162, 05162, and it's the Hebrew word nachum. And it means, actually, it's translated comfort 57 times and repent 41 times. It appears a total of 108 times in the Old Testament. And we'll see why the word is translated comfort and repent and what those two words end up having in common. 
and it, it really help, will help you understand what the word comfort means, and the idea of the Holy Spirit of God being our comforter ties into that. So it means to be sorry, it means to console, uh, uh, it can mean to regret, it can also mean to be comforted, and um, you can comfort oneself, you can be comforted by another, you can be sorry, be moved to pity, you can have compassion. All these things fall under the word repent. Now, usually the way we define the word repent is, you know, changing direction. You know, I'm going this way. But that's not really what the word means. That is the result of repentance. Okay, so it's like, uh, it's like James says in chapter 2. I mentioned this, uh, I think, Sunday night where James says, faith without works is dead. Show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. Uh, that works is the result or the outcropping of faith. If you have genuine faith, the works will be there. If you re have genuine repentance, there will be an outward change that works its way out. Okay, So the outward change is not the repentance. Repentance really is an inward thing. And uh, and again, uh, we're going to see this as we look at it. So let's just go through the Old Testament, uh, some of the different usages, and then, um, and then we'll jump over to the New Testament, and you'll find that it's much the same, used much the same way uh, as it is in the Old Testament. So uh, as I mentioned, it's the word um, nachum is translated as comfort more than it is translated as repent, and just to give you a couple examples of this, in fact, um, since I don't have it on the PowerPoint, we'll, we'll just get some volunteers to read. I got uh, two passages in Genesis. Would somebody like to read Genesis 5.29 for me? So give us a chance to absorb this a little bit. Genesis 5.29, any volunteer to read? All right, Donna, and then Genesis 24.67. Genesis 24.67. All right, Shannon. So the, this is translated as comfort in these passages. We'll, we'll let the ladies read them, and then I'll explain what, what the word has to do with what we're talking about. So Donna? Okay, so... Uh, Noah, when he's born, he's given the name Noah, and it, and it was said of him that uh, this same, or he would comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord had cursed. Okay? And then I'm going to have Shannon read hers, and then we'll look at two, these two together. Okay, so again, uh, Isaac marries Rebecca, and the Bible says that he was comforted after his mother's death. Now, the word comfort, it means to be sorry. It means to console oneself. It means to repent, regret. Uh, it can mean regret um, and, and have that mindset. So with, with Noah and his naming, uh, this same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands. Okay, so when this prophecy on Noah, when we think of the word comfort, maybe I'll save this until we get a little lower in and we see some other usages of the word repent, and I'll tie it together then. It'll probably make more sense if I do it in a few minutes. But if you think about how we traditionally understand the word comfort, and again, the word the word Hebrew word is translated comfort and repent, and it's really the only word it's translated repent in the Old Testament. This same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands. So if you interpret that the way we would think of comforting, you know, oh, they're there, that kind of a thing. Well, Noah wasn't... Explain to me what of Noah's life and ministry would have that result or that effect. How, how, how would Noah in his life, what we know of Noah, how would he have comforted in the sense of they're there? How would he comforted them concerning the ground and their work?
that they toiled in because God cursed the ground. Can you think of any way that would work? Okay. All right. I, I'm definitely going to wait for a minute. And uh, let's look at the rest of the word comfort. We'll come back and tie this, this all together in a minute. Because if I explain it now, you're not going to believe me because I haven't laid the proper foundation. Let me lay the foundation, and then we'll build on it. All right, um, so there's a couple usages of the word comfort, and again, it's used many times in the Old Testament. This is just a sampling of, of the context in which that word is used. It's also translated repent, and by the time we're done with this, we'll have a firm understanding of this. All right, Genesis chapter 6 uh, so let's uh, get a couple more volunteers to read here. Somebody read Genesis 6, 6, and 7. All right, Dale. And then Exodus 32, 14. All right, Kaynette. All right, we'll, we'll have them read these two. I've got a couple more I'll read, and then uh, we'll look at this. But this is, the word repent in the Old Testament is more often used in reference to God than it is in reference to man. In fact, I believe I have every reference when repentance, man repenting is used in the Old Testament, and that comes to a sum total of about three or four times. Um, and the rest of the time, it's in reference to God. All right? So, again, we are going to look at this and see if we can come to a good understanding of this word. All right, so Dale, Genesis chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. Okay, so twice in there it says it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. And at the end of verse 7, it says, for it repented me that I have made them. All right, so again, going back to our definition, to be sorry, to console oneself, to regret, comfort or be comforted. In this case, it's not translated that way. We know it's, it's the idea of being sorry or regretful. Now, does that definition fit what God is expressing here, that he is sorry or he's regretful that he made man on the earth? Yeah. They, they were so wicked and they're so evil in his sight that it grieved him that he, he had made man on earth. Okay. So he, he wasn't basking in what man had become. He was, he was genuinely hurt by it and was grieving over what man had become. All right, Exodus uh, 32, 14, Cana. Okay, and this is one of the many times when the Israelites complained and God was going to wipe them out and start over with Moses and Moses would, would interfere and and ask God not to do that. And it says here that the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Again, so does this express that God is sorry or regretful in, in that sense, that he, is, he was going to destroy them and then he ends up not? Does that express that he is sorry about what he was thinking or that he was regretting the way he was thinking, not in the same sense that we do, because what we do is evil or wrong, but he, he's not happy about it. As God continues to listen to Moses' plea, Moses appeals to the righteous part of God and the merciful part of God at the same time. And it says that he repented, it repented of the evil. And the word evil, maybe we should do a word study on that, but the word evil in the Bible is very often just a contrast between something that is pleasant and something that is unpleasant. Okay? Um, so evil, not always in the sense of if we're talking about wickedness, the Bible just calls it wickedness. If we're talking about sinfulness, we're ta then the Bible says sinful. But the word evil can just mean 
as opposed to that which is beautiful and pleasant and happy and <laughs> that. So God can do whatever he wants. And if he rained hellfire and brimstone down on the Israelites, he was allowed to do that. He would still be God if he did that, and he'd still be perfect if he did that. So we're not talking about evil in the sense of doing wrong. Because he can do whatever he wants. It's just of the not pleasantness that he was about to bring on them. And the Lord repented. Again, are we, does, does the definition that we've been looking at make sense in this passage? I think it does. Okay? God is, God is righteous and he's holy, but he's also loving and he's merciful. And so God was able to appeal, or Moses was able to appeal to that merciful, loving side of him rather than the justice, holiness side of him. And therefore, God said, okay, I'm not going to do what I was thinking about doing. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to do something else. So that is uh, a couple usages there. Another one is in Judges chapter 2 and verse 18 where it says, and when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. Okay, so the Lord was repent. It repented the Lord because of their groanings. So what is being described in the book of Judges here is that what would happen in this period of time before there was a king and after Moses had died is that the Israelites would, um, they would begin to worship and adopt pagan, um, pagan practices. God, because he told them before they ever went in the promised land, this is what he would do. He would raise up a nation to oppress them. A, a, another group of people would come in and oppress them and steal their crops and make their life miserable. And then when they cried out to God and when they groaned because of the heavy hand of oppression against them, he would raise up a judge and, they, and that judge would deliver them out of the hands of the Philistines or the Amorites or whoever it was at the time. And, and all the days of that judge's life, they would, you know, they would have safety and security once again. And it says God did that because it repented him of, because of the groanings by reason of them that oppress them. So again, the definition of the word repent that we have is to be sorry. Well, do you think God, when he hears the groanings of his people, that it causes a, a grief to him that would change, end up changing the course of, of their, their reality? If I could just put it that way. This means yes, this means no. You, you don't have to answer verbally. You can, you can, you can hide it. You can, you can do a little sign language, yes or no, uh, something like that. And so you don't embarrass yourself if you think you got the wrong answer. But So, you know, can God be sorry in the sense that he is grieved over something? Yes, we see it. We've already seen it three times now. And again, uh, there's far more reference to God repenting in the Old Testament than there is of man repenting because the word, the word is not directly associated with sin, that we repent from sin. The word just means to it, it's an inner sorrow. It's a regret. Um, it can mean to comfort or be comforted, but it, it ultimately, uh, when we talk about repentance, we're talking about being sorry. It's an inward thing. So God is, in his righteousness, he's decided he's going to oppress the nation of Israel when they cry out to him because of that oppression and they ask for forgiveness and they ask for his deliverance. God is moved by that so that he then intercedes by sending a judge to deliver them out of the hand of their enemies. That's what Judges chapter 2 says. Okay. So this is giving us an insight into the nature of God and who he is. On one hand, he's righteous. On the other hand, he's merciful. On one hand, he's holy. On the other hand, he's loving. And so both work together, and sometimes God's justice wins out, and like on Sodom and Gomorrah, he sent hellfire and brimstone down on them 
because on their part, there was no repentance. So God just, just did it. But you read in the book of Jonah that the Ninevites, who were probably every bit as wicked as the Sodomites and the Gomorites or whatever you call them, um, and yet when Jonah went and preached there, the Bible says that they, they repented in sackcloth and ashes, and then the Bible says that the Lord repented of the evil that he would do to them. And again, that word evil, not in the sense of wickedness. The Bible just uses the word wickedness or sinfulness or anything like that to speak of that. The word evil is just a contrast to that which is uh, what we would say is good or lovely. And so, um, you know, when God... It, it, God rains down hellfire and brimstone on your city, you wouldn't say, hey, that's a good day in town. Um, so that's, the word is just a contrast to the other. So it's not that God does anything that's evil. So um, 1 Samuel 15, 11 says, it, for I, it repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. That's God speaking, tells Samuel. It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel and he cried unto the Lord all night. So again, God is, is regretful, he's sorrowful, not that he's surprised by, but what Saul was doing as king, how he had turned from following God, that brought a grief and a sorrow to God. And he said, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sad that I made Saul king. What he's done makes me regret that I made him king. Psalm 110, verse 4, The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So there are times when God says, I'm going to do this, and the Bible says he will not repent. He will, he will never regret that. He will never be sorry for that. It's not something that man in, in our interest... It, it would be like saying, um, you know, okay, I'm going, I'm going to pray for Jesus not to come back. I'm going to pray for God to change his mind about coming back. Yeah, he, he ain't, he's not going to listen to that. Because what Jesus said, he said, I will come again. So by him promising that, he has sworn by that. And he'll never be sorry or regret that he made that statement. And he's coming back whether everybody wants him to or doesn't want him to. It's totally irrelevant. He's going to do it because he said he's going to do it. And that's what Psalms is talking about. You know, God, God told Jonah, go to Nineveh because in 30 days I'm going to destroy them. Jonah says, go ahead and destroy them. I'm okay with that. Uh, after some convincing in the whale's belly, he goes and he preaches. And sure enough, the Ninevites repent. And, God, and then God says, okay, I'm, going to, I'm not going to destroy them because they, they have repented of their wickedness. So God repented of the evil that he was planning to do to them, okay? Well, again, God did not promise, I am going to set out and destroy this. I'm going to destroy the city of Nineveh, but God says, but if man will repent, if man will take away the reason for which I'm going to destroy them through repentance, then I'll turn away from that, and I won't do that. But then there are times when God just says, this is what I'm going to do. I've said I'm going to do it. That's what I'm going to do. And you can't change my mind about it. And I will never repent of those things that I have sworn to do. And so in the nature of God, there are, there are times that we can, um, we can influence God through intercessory prayer. We can, uh, we can overt uh, some impending chastisement on us if we will repent. And then there are other things that are just, God is going to do this because that's what God does, and there's nothing I can do about it because uh, he promised he, that's what he was going to do. I mean, it's, it's, it's like praying for God not to keep a promise that he's made. It's impossible for him to break a promise. So, there's no point in praying. And he's never going to feel bad that he made the promise. You got all these people, oh, no, God, no. He's not going to feel bad about it. Like, I made this promise because it's the right thing. It's a good thing. I'm God. I get to decide what I promise. I promise. And I don't care if you like it or not. I'm still going to do it. It's not going to make me feel a bit bad that I'm keeping my promises. Um, and some of the promises, by the way, some of the promises in the Bible are not happy promises. 
Some of them are negative promises. And like, yea, and all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Well, that's a promise. You can take it to the bank. It doesn't say might or maybe. It says shall. So you, you go out of your way to live godly, you're going to be persecuted for it. That's, that's a promise, too. <laughs> Just like I will come again, they're both promises. We like one, we don't like the other, but God is, that's just the way it's going to be. All right, so now let's look at how the Old Testament refers to repentance from man's standpoint. Exodus 13, 17, if somebody would like to read that tonight. We got a slow bunch tonight. I have to beg and plead and borrow. All right, I'm not going to wait around. Exodus 13, 17 says, And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war, and they return to Egypt. All right? So God did not take them the short way around the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. Instead, he took them a, a very odd route, actually, uh, when you look at it. Uh, he took them in a very strange route, but he said, if I take them that way, they're gonna, first people they're going to run into is the Philistines. Philistines are big and tough, and they're going to say, oh, why did we leave? We should go back. Uh, we got to fight these people? Uh-uh. And so God took them. By the way, if God had taken them that way, they would have never seen the Red Sea parted. They still had the plagues to go by, but they would not have seen the Red Sea parted. They would not have seen the Jordan River parted either. So God took them the long way because they needed some time to grow up in their relationship with God and get to know him a little bit before he took them in to do some heavy-duty fighting. So he took them the, the long way. And God often takes us the long way because we ain't ready for the shortcuts. So next time you feel like God's taking you around the long way, it's not his fault, it's your fault. You were ready. If you were ready for the Philistines, he'd have taken you that way, but you ain't ready for the Philistines, so you going out to the desert for a while. All right? Judges 21.15 says, And the people repented them for Benjamin, because that the Lord had made a breach in the tribes of Israel. And again, uh, long backstory there, but the Bible says the people repented. Uh, they, they said to God, we are, we are sorry, there was a grief, there was a regret there. That then changed, it, that repentance on the inside then changed what they did on the outside. And so they changed their behavior because of what they had decided on. Job 24, I'm sorry, Job 42 in verse 6. Wherefore, Job said, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. And again, when we looked at this a few weeks ago on Sunday morning, I pointed out the fact that Job was described as a just man and upright in his generation. Job, it wasn't like Job was some wicked guy, uh, but when you come to the very last chapter of Job, Job has encountered God, and, and he regrets the, some of the questioning of God that he did. Not that he ever thought God was bad or anything. Thing like that, he just was trying to make sense of all this, and he was questioning God in a way he shouldn't have, in a way that caused him to regret it. And so he said, "I I repent. I'm I'm sorrowful over the way I'm, I'm wondering what God is doing here in such a way that's calling into question, you know, whether God's really in control." And and so you know, God has a conversation with Job. Job encounters God. God Job comes away saying. Oh, wow, you know, now I really understand. You know, I, I wish I hadn't have questioned him the way I had because now I know things are a different way. So hopefully that makes sense. I want to do the New Testament uh, real quick, and then I want to go back to those first two verses uh, we did where, where that word is translated comfort, and uh, I think all of this will tie together nicely, finish laying the foundation for that. All right, so in the New Testament, again, there's really only one word. There's a couple different forms of the word used, but the, the main word translated repent um, is netin o eo, uh, which is um, 34 times it appears in the New Testament. Uh, and it means to change one's mind, uh, change one's mind for the better. Um, and uh, and it, it usually in the New Testament has more of a correlation to sin 
than it does in the Old Testament, which has more of an idea of being sorrowful uh, or regretful. And uh, this word has more of an idea of changing your mind, amending, uh, changing your mind and then amending your, um, you know, your, your behavior, uh, making a change in that. So um, in, uh, let's try this again. Uh, we're going to be in Matthew. Anybody would like to read a verse of Matthew? All right. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, it is 3340. 3340. Uh, chapter 3 and verse 2. And then hang on just a second. Let me get a couple more lined up here and then we'll come back. Uh, Matthew 1120. All right, Shannon. Matthew 1241. Canet. We'll take those three. We'll go from there. And we're not going to read all 34 passages. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And this, this statement is referred to or repeated many times. It's recorded many times in the gospel where, where the passage is parallel. So... You can, you can find this exact statement recorded about five or six times, I believe, uh, in the Gospels. But repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What's, what's the idea behind this word? Okay, that's part of it, yeah. But first, before they change their behavior, they have to change what? Yeah, they have to change the way they think. And John the Baptist was there telling them that they needed to repent. The Bible says John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. John was there to prepare the way of the Lord and, and was telling them to, you know, uh, make straight his paths. He was, he was changing their mind about who the Messiah would be. He was changing their mind about, about their personal relationship with God because if they got serious about God, they would be ready for the Messiah to come and they would recognize him when he came. And that's really what John the Baptist's message was, and that's why his was a gospel of repentance, not just the idea that, you know, you're a filthy sinner. That's really what the Pharisees' mindset was. They believed that if, if, we, if they kept the law, that that would induce the Messiah to come, that if the people were worthy enough, then God would come. And that's um, uh, actually in... Modern sort of is still a very Catholic idea that you know are we worthy enough for it um, for God? We will never be worthy. We need to stop trying to be worthy. What we need to do is just uh, have a relationship with God. He'll make us worthy. So Matthew eleven twenty. Okay, so Jesus went in, he taught some of the cities, and then because they didn't repent, he went back and he upbraided them, and the, the upbraiding is recorded there in chapter 11, and it says because they repented not. He came in, he gave them truth, they did not respond to the truth, they just continued in the way they were going, and so Jesus upbraided them. In fact, he... he told them it would be more tolerable for Sodom in the day of judgment than it would be for some of these cities because Sodom did not have the truth. They, they, they were wicked and they didn't have it, but these cities had literally the Son of God walking among them, and they, they didn't repent either. And so Jesus actually said it would be more tolerable for, for Sodom in the day of, uh, day of judgment than it would be for some of these cities. Okay, uh, Matthew twelve forty one. Okay, and so Jesus continuing to upbraid the cities, he said Nineveh is going to rise in judgment against this generation. Nineveh just had Jonah to preach to them, and they repented. These cities had the Son of God. They had God himself in the flesh, and they didn't. And so he said the, the, those who repented in Nineveh are going to rise up in judgment of this generation. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty... 
And that's a pretty shocking statement that he made uh, to the first century Jewish man uh, who was standing there who thought himself superior to the Assyrians and, um, you know, and, and, and to look at that. But he, he says, you know, it's not how bad you were. It's whether or not you repent. And so Nineveh was a wicked city. But when confronted with the truth, they repented. You folks, too, are wicked, and you've been confronted with the truth, and you didn't. So who's, who's got the right to stand in judgment of the other? <laughs> Jesus tried to flip their whole understanding of, of it backwards. Uh, Luke 13, 3, Jesus said, Nay, I tell you, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. And again, a couple times in that verse, he was talking about a couple different scenarios that had happened where a tower had collapsed and things like that. And he said, were, were these people worse than others? And he said, no, you know, except you repent, you'll also perish. They were looking at the Messiah. They thought the Messiah would come and set up the kingdom of David. They, they didn't think they needed a Messiah to save them from their sin. Jesus was there trying to teach them and show them what they needed. They refused to see it, and Jesus said, look, unless you repent, unless there's a change of mind that takes place, unless you recognize the error of your ways and, and it causes you to change uh, the way you think about things, well, then you're going to perish because you'll never change your behavior until you change your thinking. You do what you think about. So man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That's where it all starts. And so for repentance to take place, truth has to penetrate and it has to cause you to reconsider the way you think about things. And when it's in contradiction to the word of God, well, then you have to change. That's what repentance is. Um, whether that's because you're doing something evil or whether it's because you're doing something ignorant. You know, they're, they're, God does treat sins of ignorance differently. Uh, they're both sins, but he doesn't respond the same way uh, to sins of ignorance as he does to sins of, of, of rebellion. Uh, and so God always has punished rebellion far more severely than he, you know, the Bible says the times of their ignorance God winked at. So there was a time when man didn't have the law, didn't know what God's standards were, and the Bible says God winked at that because they were ignorant. And then there were other times when they were just in full rebellion, and then he rains fire and brimstone down on them. You know, well, what's the difference? One is of rebellion, the other is of ignorance. God is patient with the ignorant. He's not patient with the rebellious. And there's a big difference between the two. We like to think because we're saved, we cannot be rebellious against God. And yet, sometimes we are more rebellious against God than the average lost person because they're ignorant. They don't know what they're doing is wrong. We know what we're doing is wrong. We're doing it anyway. One is worse than the other in God's eyes. Okay, Acts 3.19. Repent ye, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. A repentance has to happen in order for a conversion to happen. At some point, you have to go from thinking wrongly about the gospel and Jesus Christ and your relationship with him to thinking rightly about it. There has to be a repentance in which, confronted with the truth of God's word, you say, God is right and I am wrong and I'm going to change the way I think to agree with what God has said. That's necessary for belief to take place. It's necessary for salvation to occur. That's why Jesus said, except you repent, you shall likewise perish. It's why, why, you know, when we talk about repentance, you know, we have to acknowledge that we're a sinner before we can be saved. They who are whole need not a physician, Jesus said. So if we don't acknowledge we need to be saved or we have some reason to be saved, then why, how could we get saved? And so there has to be a, a time when we realize, oh, I didn't realize, <laughs> I didn't even realize that I was, my life was offending God and what I was doing was offending God uh, and that I needed Jesus Christ to save me. And now that I've seen the scripture, now I realize that, now I believe that, okay, that's repentance. And when that repentance kicks in, 
the natural thing to do then is to then accept the gospel or to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Uh, John 1.12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. So a genuine belief comes from a, I once was ignorant, now I've changed my mind because now I have the truth. And that's how salvation occurs. Um, in fact, I even had that verse I just quoted, Acts 17, 30, in the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Okay? They didn't know what to repent from because they didn't way back then have the law and have the word of God, but now we do, and the command is you better repent. You, you better stop thinking about me the way you've been thinking about me you start thinking about me the way I've said you need to think about me. You're a sinner, I'm a holy God, and that only through Jesus Christ can you be saved. You, you have to think that way. Okay, and um, so there was a time when God winked at the ignorance. Now he's not winking at it. He's saying, you better get the right answer and you better repent. There's no more winking going on. I'm patient, but I'm not winking at it. You're commanded to repent, and whether you do or not is going to determine where you spend eternity. So, no more, no more winking. Uh, Revelation, uh, finishing out uh, a couple of verses in Revelation. Revelation 2.5, uh, he tells, I can't remember which church this is off the top of my head, but it says, Remember, uh, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, might be the church at Ephesus, I can't remember. Or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove all thy candlestick, uh, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. So again, God, Lord Jesus speaking to one of his churches, he tells them they need to repent and go back to doing their first works. They had, they had turned away from what they were supposed to be doing, and they, uh, they needed to turn back. They needed to change their mind. Uh, and start thinking biblically again. And if you think biblically, you'll act biblically. If you think carnally, you'll act carnally. Um, Revelation 16, 9, And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him glory. Okay? They refused to change. They refused to see it any other way. They rejected whatever... God was doing to them, it made them reject him continually. They refused to repent. Two verses later, in Revelation 16, verse 11, it says, And blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. So clearly they are not, they're not going to change. Not going to change their mind, and they're certainly not going to change their behavior. And God, of course, is just pouring out his judgment upon them. All right, so now I want to go back for a second to those two verses in Genesis that the Hebrew word is translated as comfort 57 times, repent as 41 times. So I want to go back to that. Uh, those are Genesis 5.29 and Genesis 24.67. In Genesis 5.29, the Bible says, And he called his name Noah, saying, The same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. You should think about Noah's life for a second and think, how does Noah, how does Noah's life comfort them? And again, don't interpret the word comfort the way we think about it. Oh, they're there. You know, put your arm around them, they're there, it's gonna be okay. It's the same word as translated repent in other places. So we have the sense of where that word is going. How does Noah, how does his life comfort them concerning all the work and the toil because of the ground that God has cursed? Anybody want to jump? Anybody brave enough to go out into the deep end of the pool with me for a minute? I promise I won't let you drown. I'm a good lifeguard. Put your floaties on, it'll be okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, 
means to be sorry, to regret, but it also means to comfort oneself. Let's do an easier one. Let's do the other one in Genesis 24. And then, then we'll come back and see if you've got some thoughts on Genesis 5. I think Genesis 5, actually the first time the Hebrew word appears in the Bible, um, Nahum, which is translated both comfort and repent. Let's go to Genesis 24, 67. Isaac gets married. Remember, Abraham's servant goes. He finds Rebekah, brings Rebekah back to be Isaac's wife. This is three years after his mother Sarah had died. It says, And Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her, and Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Okay. What, what practical... What practical effect does the consoling have on him? I, I couldn't hear you. Okay. You could be right. I just couldn't hear you. <laughs> what practical effect did the consoling or the comforting have on Isaac? Before, Re okay, let's do this. Before Rebecca gets married, Isaac is still grieving for his mother in some ways, right? Because he's not comforted after his mother's death until he gets married. So, you know, the only woman really that he had had in his life was his mother. And, his, you know, of course, she was special because she was 100 years old or 90 years old when she, he was born. And so God got miraculously allowed her to conceive and to nurse him and all those kinds of things. So he had a very special bond with his mother. She dies, and for three years, he's not comforted from her death. So when he gets married and he meets Rebecca, they get married, and once he has a wife and a, a relationship with a new woman, a of course, a completely different type of relationship, He's comforted after his mother's death. What is the practical effect there, Bill? Yes. Yeah, there's, there's a change that takes place. Before, what is he thinking about? He's thinking about the loss of his mother. When he gets married, is he thinking about the loss of his mother anymore? Not, not, in, not in the same way. Now he's thinking about his responsibilities to his wife. So he's no longer in grieving. He's now being a husband. So there's a change that has taken place in him where it's almost as if you could, you could apply the definition here where it's like he regrets the sorrow and the grieving and so he is changing and tur turning away and coming over here. Now he's got a different mindset, and a different mindset brought a different set of actions. Does that make sense? So that's how that word comfort ties in with the word repentance. When you comfort somebody, you take them from one way of thinking and being, and you change them into another. And that's how you achieve. That's the practical effect of the comfort. Is it changes them from one thought process or one way of thinking, one way of being. It changes them to an, another one. And that's how comfort and repentance tie in. So if we go back to Genesis 5 and we think about Noah, Noah's born and he's named and a prophecy is put on him that, that they would be comforted from the work and the toil uh, because God had cursed the ground. So think about Noah's life. Now this, this is, again, a little bit more difficult because often we think of repentance as a change that ends up in the better. This is one of those cases in which it doesn't. <laughs> this is a comforting, not for the better.
Okay, so what, did, what is Noah famous for doing? Let's just start with that. Building the ark. Why did God, or why did Noah build the ark? God told him, why did God tell him he needed to build the ark? Yeah, because he was going to flood the earth. He was going to destroy mankind. Okay. They were over here in this post-creation world, evil and wicked and working and toiling because God cursed the earth because of sin. They were going to get soon comfort from their work and their toil. Exactly. They got changed from the people that they were <laughs> into oil. <laughs> Them and all the dinosaurs and, and, you know, not all of them because there would have been two of each on the ark. Um, but he, he comforted them. They didn't have to work. In Noah's day, Noah, they didn't have to work anymore because they were all dead. And they were only dead because they chose to be dead. They chose not to get on the ark. There's nothing stopping any of them from saying, you know what, I, I repent. This is not good. This is not right, what I'm doing. And I believe God's going to destroy the earth, and I don't want to be a part of it. And I'm, I'm going to help you build this ark, and I'm going to help. I'm going to do my best to do what, live the way God would have me do, like you do, Noah. And uh, I, want, I want my family to be saved. We're going to come on the ark with you. They could have done that. They didn't. But in either case, they got comforted from their toils. <laughs> He shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. It changed. And there came a point in time when they didn't have to worry about working and toiling in the garden anymore and growing crops. Uh, I, I assume the Bible calls uh, Noah preacher of righteousness, so I would assume that Noah, for 120 years between the time God told him he'd flood the earth, that he preached it, and people came by, saw him building this big boat in the backyard, and said, are you nuts? How are you going to get that thing to the ocean? Uh, don't worry about that, the ocean's coming to us. Oh, you're an idiot, Noah. You're a fool. You're, you're a crazy old man. And then it started to rain. Noah didn't look so stupid anymore. All right, any questions about repentance? Like I said, Sunday starts our revival, and that will go through Wednesday of next week. So next Wednesday night, we'll be finishing up our revival meeting with Brother Willett. Uh, excited about it, praying for it, and uh, looking forward to uh, seeing what God does. Uh, Brian and I took the third pallet of John and Romans down to the post office today. There's another 8,900 and something that went out, and... Um, so those are actually going to be going to this area of the 43230 zip code. Most of those routes are up in this area. Uh, some of them are a little bit different pocket. But um, uh, Saturday at the Super Saturday, if it's raining, we're just going to try to get all the rest of the John and Romans bundled up and uh, get that project done. And then uh, next week, Brian and I will take both pallets down and uh, finish the project for 2022. Uh, if the weather holds, uh, those that are able will go out and uh, we'll do some more door hangers, invite some people to church. And uh, that all kicks off 9 o'clock on Saturday here, and we're going to kick off with breakfast. The owls are going to be providing some breakfast for us from 9 to about 9.45, and we'll start cleaning up. And uh, we'll get, uh, get everything turned over for um, those that are going to stay and bundle the John and Romans uh, to do that, and then the rest of us will get, get our maps and get a team, and we'll go out in twos and threes and go out and uh, try and get some more door hangers out. So rain or shine, the event is on, and rain will just determine whether we go out or we stay in. But either way, we're going to do something for the Lord regardless. So that is 
going on there. And um, there's a couple of signups still on the table back there uh, for like the fall harvest party and um, something else going on. But, oh, the, um, the men's conference, if, if any of the men interested in going to the men's conference, uh, there's a sign up back there. Uh, for that, and I need to uh, start getting some hotel rooms reserved here pretty quick. So if you haven't signed up, do that tonight. Uh, we are going to, when Bible study is over tonight, we are going to stack all the chairs. Uh, Mike and I and uh, anyone else who shows up to help, we are going to clean the carpets in here and uh, in as many other places as we can and try to get that done before revival, so the fellowship hall desperately needs it, and the lobby and, ha and hallways are rough, and then certain places around the back there are, are pretty pretty rough, so we're going to try and get as much of that done as we can, and so uh, if you want to help stack, you can, and uh, if you don't, uh, when we come to your area, I need you to get up. <laughs> so we can get it done. And uh, we're going to stack them up, and we're going to move full stacks up against the wall um, over here. Now we're going to do three quarters of it. We're going to lay this side back out and then move the rest of them in the center aisle, do the last little bit of it, and then hook all the chairs back together on this side and set up for Saturday. So, uh, so if you want to help, you can. If you don't want to, can't help, that's fine. Uh, just uh, don't sit there. We can't pick up the chair with you in it. So, all right. Um, I think that's about it. Um, tonight is it. If you were planning on giving uh, at, to the special offering we're doing for uh, the relief for Hurricane Ian, I need you to do that tonight. Uh, so you'll need to uh, either drop that in the offering box if you're giving in person, or before you even leave here tonight, you need to go online go to our app, go to wherever, and um, make that donation. So if you need help doing it online, don't have the right device, we can help you with that as long as you know your password, and um, we, can, we can get you set up on that. And then um, if you're giving in person, just drop it in the box back there. Uh, but we need to have that tonight. We're going to write a check tomorrow morning and get that out to Nehemiah's network. So um, if you have any questions about that, let me know. All right. Well, let's go over to our prayer list tonight. And I did, did get to this.